the all right. So today's class, we're now going down the stack of the system, and we're going to start talking about how uh, to actually store things. Um, right. So the, the the last class was all about um, we talked about indexes and concurrent control for the, for the most part of the semester. Now to say now we're going down to the system and say how we're actually going to store data. So before we jump into this, uh, there were two major announcements in in the world of databases last week. I'm really curious to know if they if they saw that and knew what they were. Yes. Yeah, so that, that was the first one. All right, well, all right, so I got that order. Right, so <laughs> the first one was Altabase was the uh, one of the first in-memory databases out of Korea in the 1990s. They announced that they're now open source. Uh, I actually, it's, everything's on GitHub. I spent some time looking at the source code. It's like, um, it's not very easy to read because all of the directories have uh, are just three characters, right? With the naming, uh, so that's reminiscent of the old days, I suppose. Um, and then the second thing was, as he said, my clicker's not working, uh, is that MongoDB announced that they now support transactions. Uh, so I've known about this for a while. They were talking talking about this in the summer when I went to go visit them. Um, the, the reason why this is, this is sort of a big deal is because. MongoDB was, was sort of the, the, the vanguard, the stalwart of the NoSQL movement, but basically says, we're not gonna, we're, we don't care about SQL, we don't care about the relational model, we don't care about transactions. Um, and pretty much every NoSQL system has added some support of some more or less, or any NoSQL system that, that people are using widely has added support for SQL and something that looks like the relational model. Um, and for Mongo to add transactions is sort of like the, the, to me, like sort of the last nail in the coffin of like this, this trend of like, hey, we don't need to do anything that like that like traditional databases have been doing for years. Now, some things that the NoSQL guys do, I think they got correctly, or they, they, did, they did right, and we can borrow those ideas in our own system, but not doing transactions, but you, but you want to support updates, uh, in my opinion, was, uh, was a mistake, and you can see that uh, MongoDB has added this. And so they are aware of their, um, how do I say this? Uh, the, the sort of public opinion of that you know, MongoDB puts out features and they fix, fix bugs later on. Um, so they aware of these issues that they've had in the past and the reputation. And so they assured me that, that when they're adding transactions now, that they're going to spend time to make sure it's, it's being done correctly before they put it out in the real world. Cassandra put out transactions, or what they call lightweight transactions, a, uh, a few years ago. Uh, it's basically just compare and swap, and that turned out to have a bug that people could, could hit a corner case and come up with incorrect results. So, all the bases open source, MongoDB's at ending transactions. Let's keep going. Okay, so for today, today's lecture, we're gonna talk about, uh, again, at different levels, how we're actually gonna store data. So we're gonna start off talking about the way we wanna represent uh, the, the types in our system, the types in our database. Then we'll talk about how we're gonna lay things out in memory. And then we'll get into the stuff that you guys read about was how do we represent uh, the tables in memory, what different uh, storage models we want to use, and then we'll finish up talking about um, uh, talking about uh, the catalog stuff. All right, so uh, you know I'm going to keep clicking this unless I put it in for real. Um, let's see if that works now. No, awesome. Awesome. Okay. So I think we showed this picture at the beginning of the semester. Um, right, this is the basic overview of how an in-memory database is architected. Right, we have our, our in-memory index. We do a lookup on some key. We end up with a block ID and offset. And this is going to point to some fixed length data block. Uh, and the offset tells us where to jump down and find our tuple. And then any, any attribute in our tuple that is larger than 64 bits, we're going to have a pointer to some location in a variable length pool where we want, we want to store that data. Right, so at a high level, this is what we're doing. So today we're talking, we're talking about how we actually want to rep represent these two things. So the way to think about of a, uh, an in-memory database is that it's essentially just a large byte buffer, a large byte array. And we're going to write code in our system, in our database system, that can allow us to interpret those bytes to represent the, uh, the values of our tuples, the values in our, in our database. Right, so essentially what happens is you're gonna to jump to some offset and then you're gonna look in your schema for your table, which is stored in the catalog, and it's gonna tell you uh, how to convert those bytes or interpret those bytes 
into uh, the the type you expect there to be. You expect there to be, right? So if if I jump to some offset and I know I went to fourth tuple and that fourth tuple is a 32-bit integer, I know how to interpret those bytes as a 32-bit integer and then do whatever it is that I, that I need to do. So we talked about this before when we talked about MVCC, where every tuple is going to be prefixed with a header that's going to contain some metadata, you know, things like timestamps that you can use for visibility uh, and you know, flags to say whether a tuple has been deleted or not. Um, but for all the information we need to, in order to interpret the bytes and say you know, this, this offset is a 32-bit integer, that's going to be stored separately in, in, in the schema. Right? It's stored in the centralized location. We can do a lookup in the catalog and say, we, we know it's this type. Right? Contrast this with Mongo, where you know, they use the document model, where they don't have a fixed schema, so they have to embed in every single document what the actual type is. So the reason why we want to store all our tuples in this fixed length uh, manner in the fixed length data blocks is that it's going to be really easy for us to be able to, to compute uh, what the starting location in memory is for when a tuple starts. Right? We do simple arithmetic. We know, when, we, know when, we know the memory address where the block is. We know that we want the fifth tuple, and so therefore we know how to do simple math and say, jump to this offset within that block, and that's the starting location of my tuple. And so because of this, we don't have to have a extra indirection layer like you would have to have in a disk-based system. Right? Disk-based system, the index will give you back the, the, the page number and then the slot number. And then when you go inside the slot, there's another indirection layer that says, or go inside the page, you look up the slot array, and that tells you what offset now in the, in the page has the tuple that you want. So it's sort of a, an extra step you have to do a lookup. Whereas in our case here, we don't have to do that. We can go directly within the block to the offset that we need. So one thing to be mindful about all of this is that essentially what we're doing, what we're trying to do, is map the, um, the, the database pages to the physical hardware pages. We want to try to do this in an efficient manner and have it be almost a one-to-one -one mapping so that we don't have to do have the operating system or the, the hardware itself do extra work anytime you need to access data. So this shouldn't be any, any news to any of you here because everyone should have taken an OS course as part of their undergrad or in the background for this course. Um, but essentially the operating system is going to, to basically map the physical pages that are in memory to virtual memory pages that it maintains. And the idea here is that it's, it allows the, having this indirection allows the, the, the operating system to move the location of, of virtual memory pages around in physical memory without having to notify or uh, modify the, the application code. So if we had, say, a, a memory page, a virtual memory page that was mapped to one DIM, we can move it to another CPU, and the application wouldn't know, wouldn't care. We, didn't, we wouldn't have to change any code. So essentially how this works is that the CPU's uh, memory management unit is going to maintain this translation, translation look aside buffer, the TLB, that's going to map these virtual memory addresses to physical addresses. Right? So if I want to look up a virtual memory address, I know where physical address has it. And so the, the TLB is sort of a special case, a special uh, location in the CPU caches that, uh, that the, the system is going to maintain but it can't obviously store everything in the TLB for all possible memory pages because this would be really, really big. So your CPU cache would be taken up by just the TLB. So the, the hardware is going to be able to manage how things are moved in and out of the TLB. Um, but in, in general, we want to have as few as TLB misses as possible. So when you allocate a block of memory in our database system, the, the, the memory allocator itself is going to be in charge of making sure that the, our memory block it will fit into the page boundaries. So typically you have four kilobyte pages. So even if I allocate you know, eight kilobytes, um, it's still gonna get broken up internally as two four kilobyte pages. And it does this because we wanna avoid fragmentation and having large holes that we can't, we can't reuse efficiently. So the question that often comes up now uh, in in-memory databases when you start talking about memory pages is that is there, is, can we use larger page sizes to reduce the amount of metadata that the system has to maintain for all the pages we've allocated in, in our system. So in, in Linux, there's a, there's a feature optimization called transparent viewed pages, where the idea is that we can instruct the operating system to uh, allocate pages on, on, on sizes larger than the default, default four kilobytes, right? So you can say, I want my pages to all be two megabytes or one gigabyte. Um, and so these pages are always have to be stored contiguously as large blocks of memory. 
And the idea here is that by having larger blocks of memory that we're using as the underlying physical storage for our in-memory database, is that we're gonna have fewer entries in our TLB. That means we're gonna have fewer TLB misses and fewer cache misses that, because of this. So there's a way to do this manually in, in Linux or in an operating system. You can say, I wanna use huge pages for my process, right? Um, but there's another feature called transparent huge pages where underneath the covers, the operating system is gonna organize your pages in the background for you automatically. So you can, if you turn this feature on, then you start allocating things as one, um, one gigabyte pages, what will happen is it'll start splitting up uh, uh, smaller, or, or combining smaller pages into larger pages or taking larger pages and splitting up into smaller pages and it starts re moving around where your memory is actually being located. Because this is all virtual memory, it knows where the physical address is and so you think you're accessing things uh, just the way, you know, where they were before the first time you allocated that memory. But underneath the covers, the operating system could have moved things around unbeknownst to you. <coughs> so this sounds like this is what we would want in an MME database because it'd be nice to have your TLB misses, it'd be nice that have the operating system, we organize our memory for us. Um, but the problem is when it starts moving things around, anytime you access that memory that's in the process of moving, you're, it's gonna have to stall your process, or like block your thread until that operation finishes. And so for really, really large in-memory databases, uh, this can become problematic because now you know, people report that the stall from the operating system could take seconds. And that's, that's just as bad as going to disk, right? So that's bad. And so, the, I mean, obviously the advantage of this is quite, quite huge because again, if, if instead of having four kilobyte pages, if you can have two megabyte pages, you dramatically reduce the number of uh, TLB entries you have. But in general, we, this, this doesn't work out. So in the, I think Linux 4.6, they added a new option where um, if you try to allocate memory and if the, with a huge page and it can't find a contiguous slot, uh, block of memory, instead of just blocking while it reorganize, reorganizes everything, it can defer the, the operation and go to a smaller page and some back, sometime later on, reorganize things but then you still have to pay the stall if you hit it during this period here. So almost every single in-memory database, sorry, every database in general, not just in-memory databases, tell you in the documentation to disable transparent huge pages and mostly huge pages in general. Um, and again, this is because just the overhead of having to maintain all this in the operating system is, is, is bad. We want the data system to do this everything for us, right? Because we know the best. We know what's best for our application and our, and our workload. Uh, the other problem with, with huge pages is that even if you only touch, you know, one byte, you still allocate the entire space, right? And so if you have to do this for really huge pages, if I only touch one byte in a one gigabyte page, right, that's a large chunk of memory that's going to get tied up. So again, these are just links to some, some documentation pages where they say all is basically the same thing. Do not run your data system with, with trans transparent huge pages or huge pages. Right? Some of these systems will actually throw an error if you try to turn them on and it looks in the operating system and says, oh, I'm running with huge pages, and it'll, it'll, it'll crap out and says, I, I won't do that. The only system that I know that lets you run with huge pages, and actually some cases recommends it, uh, is Postgres and Vertica. Vertica is based on Postgres, the original code, so it doesn't surprise me that it, it, it lets you do that or it follows what Postgres does. Um, in Postgres's case, as far as I can tell, they only use it for the, uh, the, the buffer pool, which runs in shared memory. And so you can have huge pages for shared memory, but then have uh, regular page sizes for your regular process, right? It's not like you can say, I want my hash table to be, you know, a, a regular page size and my, my fixed, fixed length uh, data arrays be huge pages. You have to take, it's all or nothing. So in Postgres's case, they can shove it off to shared memory and have huge pages there where you do get a big benefit for your, for your, for your buffer pool. But then all the internal data structures that may have smaller access patterns they can run in regular page sizes. Yes? Can we allow the OS to keep space large enough for to avoid stories of memory access? Your question is, can we have the operating system maintain huge pages for us so that what, sorry? For, for like, to, to like allocate the memory large enough to keep the huge space. Sometimes like uh, it, it split large page to small ones. So your, your question is, can we just tell, can we, can, can we use like a hint to the operating system to allocate this large yeah, page? Yeah. 
and have it definitely be a large page, yeah. but then other things be smaller pages. Instead of like splitting into smaller pages. Again, so if, if, you, if you turn on huge pages uh, and you allocate one gigabyte, it's gonna try to do that. It always, like, it always tries. Okay. If, and then if you have the defer option, if it can't do it, then it'll let you split it, split it, you know, split it up. But then the background is going to try to put them back together. So if we use like huge page wisely, make sure that we're splitting just spacing up. The statement is if we use huge pages wisely, uh, and, and that's debatable what wisely means, right? Like if we use huge pages wisely. Yeah. So in a perfect world, this would be. If we could do this for our data blocks and then have everything else not be huge pages, that would be perfect. But as far as I know, the, the Linux doesn't doesn't allow you to do that. Now you can maybe push it off to shared memory, and I, I fully admit, I don't fully understand. I mean, I understand how shared memory works at a high level, but I don't understand how it's actually written in the kernel, and I don't understand the performance implications of having shared memory. Uh, so Postgres uses shared memory because it's a multi-process architecture, whereas most other systems are multi-threaded and they don't. So I, I don't fully understand what, what are the implications of shared memory. I will say shared memory will, will come up later on when we talk about your checkpoints, in memory checkpoints at, at Facebook Scuba, they write everything up the shared memory and restart your process. That, in that case, shared memory actually gives, provides a benefit that regular memory doesn't have. But in general, as far as I know, most no in-memory system runs with shared memory. But I don't fully understand why. Okay. So let's now talk about, so we now we know how to organize our, how we're, the, the operating system, the hardware is going to organize our memory pages. Now we want to say how we're actually going to store values in those pages. So what I'm showing here is basically an <coughs> overview of how the in-memory database is going to represent different data types in the database. So for the top, we have integers, like big and small and tiny int, medium int, integer. For these, we're just going to store them with the same representation that you get in C or C++. Like if I declare an integer variable in C++, the hardware is going to store that out you know, as, as either little endian or big endian, depending on, on what kind of CPU I'm running on. So in our database system, we're, we're basically going to piggyback off of that and use that same representation. Because the hardware can do arithmetic on that and other operations on that very, very efficiently. For uh, decimal numbers like floats and reals and American decimal, um, these are to differentiate between whether we want to support floating point numbers or fixed point precision numbers. And I'll go through more examples of these, of these two in a second. But these are what you would get directly on the hardware, right? The same way you got with integers, and how you represent them is defined by this IEEE 754 standard. And then numerics and decimals depend on the implementation of the database system. Because the hardware is going to support floating point numbers. If you need fixed point numbers, then you have to do something extra. For var char, var binary, text field, and variable length fields, as I said, typically what happens is if, the, if the, the value is less than 64 bits, you store it in line in the fixed point data tuple. If it's greater than that, then you just have a pointer to, to something else. Uh, I'll, I'll show an example of that next. For timestamps, date, time, and, and other fields, um, the newer systems typically represent this as the number of uh, seconds, microseconds, milliseconds since the Unix epoch. Um, if you get if you want a date field, some systems will store that as 32 bits versus 16 bits for timestamps. Um, for the older systems uh, that you know came out in the 1980s or things like that run on win Windows, they obviously don't use the e Unix epoch and they have their own, their own data type. The one I want to spend time on is is the floats and reels. So again, this should not be news to anyone here. If you're in this class, and you should you should have taken an operating system course or, or a systems course. You should understand there's a difference between floating point numbers and fixed point numbers. So the variable precision numbers, the floating point numbers, and this is what you get as the sort of native data type in C and C++. And these are represented in the same way that the hardware is actually going to represent them. So the hardware is going to have instructions to take two floating point numbers, add them together or multiply them or whatever you want, right? And the way it's going to expect those values to be stored in memory is the way we're going to represent it. So that makes it really easy for us to do arithmetic. So as we'll see in a second, these are going to be much faster than the arbitrary precision numbers because, again, this is just letting the hardware do all the math for us. right? We don't have to do anything extra to check for rounding gears and stuff like that. The hardware does everything. So floats are 32 bits, real and doubles are, are 64 bits. And the reason why these, these can suck is because 
the specification says that the IEEE standard says that you can't actually store these decimals as truly exact numbers. So here's a really simple program in C where I take two floats, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, and in the first case, I'm gonna add them together and get a number, and the second one, I'm just gonna take 0 0.3, and print that out, and see what that looks like. And so for this, in this printf flag, I'm basically saying give me all 20 digits of the floating point number past the decimal point. So what you see is that when you take x plus y, you get some long number here with a bunch of extra stuff at the end, and then for 0 0.3, just printing it out, you get 2.9 all the way down, followed by 8.8 8 and some other stuff, right? And again, this occurs because the hardware can't extort these numbers exactly. So you're going to hit rounding errors. If I just did printf without the 20 decimal points, I would get 0 0.3, 0 0.3. And it would look like, to me, as a human being, the same. The text representation of them are the same. But internally, in the hardware, they're going to be totally stored differently. If I try to do comparison with these two numbers, they'll come up as unequal. So the way the systems handle this is to do, um, if, you, if you need to have uh, exactness in your, in your decimals, is to do fixed point precision numbers. So the idea here is that the, the database system is going to maintain some extra metadata for the, the value that you're trying to store. And this metadata is going to be things like, you know, where's the decimal point, what am, what's my sign, um, what's the scale of my number. So the, you get this when you get numeric and decimal. In some systems, these are just synonyms for each other. In other systems like Postgres, these are actually stored slightly differently. And so the way to think of, think of that is what's going to happen is we're going to store this as a almost like a text representation of the actual number you want to store. And then the metadata allows us to then interpret that text and say, well, where's the decimal point and whether it's positive or negative, things like that. All right? And as we'll see in, in, a, in a quick demo, the performance difference of, of these things is actually quite significant. All right, so let's see if I can do this without crashing. Of course, it depends what screen it shows up on, right? All right, so, um, of course, now I can't see how to type. All right, so in this, in this, what I did was I have, I have a Postgres database, and I generated um, 10 million random numbers. And I loaded that in, in, my, in Postgres as a decimal and a, uh, as, as a decimal and, and a real. Oh, shit, I didn't want to do that. Sorry. Tmux. Okay. Cool. Right, so here's the, the, here's with decimals, and then here's with reals. And so there's two fields, A and B. And I loaded, I, lo I generated a CSV file with um, uh, 10, million, 10 million entries, so 10 million numbers. And then what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just going to do a, a scan across all of them and add them two together. So I'll do select sum A plus B. So I'll do uh, the, the reals first. And it's going to punch for a bit, spits out the answer, and it took uh, 1.2 seconds. If I run that same query now under with decimals, you see that it took almost twice as long, more than twice as long, um, and actually the value is actually different, right? And this has some uh, precision, precision beyond the decimal point, whereas in the first case here, it actually gave me back an integer, right? If I go back here and cast it as an integer, um, Right, that's the same value I got. If I try to cast it as a number, I don't think it'll let me do that. Yeah, so it lost all the precision when it, when it did the calculation, right? So again, if you want to not lose your, the, 
you, if you want to not lose the, the, the precision of your values, you want to store them as, as, as numeric or decimal type. If you, if you want performance and you're okay with rounding errors, then you store it as reals and decimals. And again, internally, what's going to happen is the, the database system is going to represent these, a lot, uh, these, these numeric and decimal types a lot differently. There's, there's a lot more metadata we have to store. So in the case of uh, Postgres, this is how they actually store internally the numeric type. So Postgres is written in C, so there's not classes, there are structs, but it's basically the same thing. So you see for one single numeric value, you're going to have to store the number of digits, the weight of the first digit, the scale factor, the sign, and then you have this numeric digit, which is just a uh, type def to the, the var chart up here, unsigned var chart. So, or the char right. So this is where you actually store the actual digit you want to store, and then you have all this extra stuff you have to maintain to figure out where, how, how to actually interpret it. And when you look at the Postgres code, right, this is just the function to do addition between two numerics. And you see there's all these clauses in here that say like, if it's this sign, do this, if it's a numeric, do that, right? So whereas before, if it was just a real or a, or a float, there's a single instruction to do addition between these two things, and that's super fast. Where in the case of, of, of a numeric, I have to do all of this just to add the two numbers together. And that's going to be much slower. So again, this is just trying to say that the, the, the way you would store internally a numeric type is a lot, there's a lot more work you have to do than just using a real. So currently in Peloton, we just follow real and double. We don't actually implement any numeric type. Um, if someone's interested in doing this in, for the project three, uh, I'm definitely interested in helping out with that. Because the kind of cool thing we can think about is not just uh, you know, how do we store it the way Postgres does it. Is there a way we can use query compilation and possibly SIMD to speed all, all this up? All right, so now that we know how to represent the bytes uh, for our types, so let's talk about how we're actually going to lay things out right? and, and then be able to access it. So here I have a really simple table. I have two fields. Um, I have a 32-bit integer and a 64-bit integer. So again, I jump to some location in memory in my fixed length block, and that's where my tuple is going to start. And again, we just think of this as a char array uh, or byte array that we then can interpret. So we're always going to have some header. In this case here, we assume it's 64 bits. In practice, it's much larger. Um, and then we have our ID field and the value field. And again, so if I want to access the ID field for this tuple, for, for this particular tuple, I know how to jump to the offset in the fixed length block, and then I know how to look in the schema in the catalog and say, well, if I want the first attribute, and it's a 32 bit integer, I jump to this offset at the starting location for the tuple. So you would you bake in the code, I know what the size of my header is, therefore I know how to jump to the right offset. And now the way you would access this in C is use reinterpret a cast to convert it to the to the type that you expect there to be. So this is actually done at, at compile time. This is not something that could you actually run. Basically, what, what this does is says it takes an arbitrary memory address and converts that reinterprets the type that you're going to examine at that memory address to be uh, in 32. Because again, this is just a byte array. The code doesn't know what, what the hell you're actually even accessing, right? So it's up for us to write our code to know that we access things in a type safe manner. And reinterpret cast will, will do that for us. For very length fields, as I said, uh, if it's less than 64 bits, then we want to store it directly in line in our in the char array for the tuple. But if it's larger, then we want to store it in the very length data block. So let's say that I have this table here and I only have one value field that's a var chart 1024. Um, when I do my lookup, again, I jump to the offset where I need. Then I look in, the, in there and I find my pointer, and that tells me to go down here in the very length block to find the data that I want. And again, in this very length block, typically what happens is the first field in, in the block or for a certain location is the length of the data I'm reading followed by a pointer to maybe the, the, a null block if it's broken up between multiple, uh, multiple blocks. Because otherwise, again, if I have to store a real large file, a real large piece of data, I don't want to have to be all continuously in memory. By having this extra next pointer, I can, I can break it up. So although you can, in theory, store like a 10 gigabyte file in your database, in practice, you don't want to do that um, for, for performance reasons, like with logging and other things. Um, in general, like there's some rule of thumb, it changes every year you know, in terms of the hardware, but in general, you don't want to store really large files because at some point, again, the overhead of managing that becomes problematic. But there is some, some files that are, are small enough to actually want to store them in. 
So in the case of SQLite, the guy says uh, they've done experiments where they find that it's actually on your phone. It's better to store thumbnail images inside of SQLite in your database because you can read them faster from disk than you can if they were separate files. Because in the case of SQLite, the file handle is already open. You just jump to the location that has the thing you need and you read it in. Whereas if it's stored as files, then you have to you know, open up the file node, the inode, and go fetch the data you need. It. And that's a syscall every single time. So one optimization you can do with this, in the same way we saw storing the prefix in the, the B plus tree from last class, you can actually put a uh, user world extra space and store a prefix for the value you're storing so that you don't have to follow the pointer and go check to see whether you actually have a match. So if I was trying to find all the fields where the first the first few characters is Andy, I could do I could do uh, I could have the prefix and avoid having to go check the actual data if I don't have a match. So as far as I know, Hyper does this, and I, I don't know if anybody else does this, um, but this is one thing that they do. All right, so now I want to talk about how we're going to store nulls. So as far as I know, there's three ways to do this. The first is that you can designate a special value in the domain of, of an attribute type to represent the null value. So in the case of, say, like a 32-bit integer, you could have the smallest integer you, you could possibly store be designated as the special value for our null. So if you look at your limits.h in libc, right, it's going to have this, these, these pound defines for the int32 min, int32 max. So you basically say int32 min is going to represent your null. Right? So if now if, if you start accessing the data and you're, trying to, uh, you're scanning the table, you're looking at a tuple, and you see this value, then you know you should be treating it as a null and not as, a, not as the true value. So I like this approach because it doesn't require you to store any extra memory to keep track of whether something's null or not because it's always going to be 32 bits, the same way a regular value is. Um, you do have to do some extra work in the upper levels of the database system to make sure that nobody comes along and tries to insert int32 min, thinking they actually store the value, but then when they read it back, they end up getting null. So this is actually what we do in Peloton, although we don't check int32 min. You know, we don't check whether you're trying to insert null uh, at the top levels of the system. Um, this is what we used in HStore and BoltDB, and this was also used in, in MonaDB. The, probably the most common approach is to use a separate bitmap header, a bitmap in the header of a tuple, to represent which columns in that tuple are null. So in that header, you're going to store some bitmap, for, and you have one, one bit for every single possible column or attribute in your tuple. And then if any of those, any of those uh, attributes are null, you just flip the bit in the header. And so now when you start accessing the tuple, you always have to check that header to see, am I accessing the real value or whether it's null or not? So this is pretty much used in everything, like Oracle, Postgres, MySQL, DB2. This, this is pretty much everyone does, times 10. Um, and the, the downside, obviously, is that you're storing extra memory. Uh, you have to store some extra, bit, you know, you're storing extra things in the header for every single tuple just because something could be null. Um, but the, downs, the, the advantage of it is that you don't have to worry about the, the, the value domain like you do in the first one here. Um, this is also why sometimes you see there's arbitrary limits on the number of columns you can have in, in a table because they have to store it, you know, every, uh, you know, a bit for every single attribute you have. So in like Postgres and SQL Server, you can have two to the 16 uh, columns per table, and that's a limit that's you know, largely imposed because you don't want this to be too big. In Oracle, they're famously only allow 1,000 columns per table. Uh, this is not done for any real you know, high-level meaning reason. It's just done for software engineering. Uh, some guy at some point hard-coded like 100 columns in the 1980s, in the 1990s, they went back and changed it to 1,000, and then they decided after that it was too much work. The third option is to store actually a separate flag per attribute that could be null uh, as a prefix for that value. So again, instead of having it in, in, the, in the header, you're going to have this little flag be put right in front of the tuple, or sorry, the single attribute. So the tricky thing, though, with this is that although the null flag only needs to be a single bit, uh, you can't actually store it just as a single bit. So you actually have to pad it out. You have to pad it out much, being much larger. So the only system that I know that actually does this is MemSQL. And so if you go look at the MemSQL documentation, right? Say this is for integers. You know they have things like what's the min and max value, but then they show you the sizes for the attributes when it could be null and when it's not null. 
And so when it's not null, it's what you expect there to be, right? A 32-bit integer is four bytes, a 64-bit integer is eight bytes, and so forth. But when it could be null, you see that the size in some cases actually double. So a 32-bit integer, which could be with four bytes when it's not null, if it could be null, has to be represented as eight bytes. And they have to do this because they have to put the flag in front of the attribute to say whether it's null or not, and it can't be a single bit, it has to be word aligned. Does everyone know what I mean when I say, when it's, when I say word aligned? Yeah. Who, 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 who here doesn't know what word alignment means? Who here is afraid to raise their hand? Okay, all right. I'll go through an example of what this is, okay. But again, so like, so, you know, Boolean's another good example. A Boolean te technically should be one bit. It's like, you know, true or false. Uh, they store it as a single byte when it's not null, but then they have to pad it up to two bytes to have that single extra bit to say whether it's null or not. Yes? But can they create their, like, representation range? Because anyway, they have to, like, have a flag. Your question, your statement is, would this allow them to increase the range yeah. of the, the of a, would be stored in a single value? Yeah. Because now they have extra space? No, because the hardware, we'll see this when we talk about word alignment, the hardware's not going to want, like, a five-byte integer. Right? There's no instruction in the x86. Yeah, yeah. To, so like, let's say uh, we have like eight bytes to like eight. Yes. And we use like seven to eleven bytes to like for the one byte. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm saying like, if your integer is now seven bytes, there's no instruction that's going to allow you to do addition of two seven byte integers, oh. <laughs> right? And it's going to mess up with your word alignment. Which we'll get, we'll get to now. All right, so I'm going to explain you what word alignment is in the context of it for an in-memory database and what, what, what we need to do to care about this. Um, but I'll say the example I'm going about to tell you is not actually how it's done. I'm going to describe word alignment in terms of 64 bits, 64 bit words. But in reality, in the hardware, it's actually 64 byte words. So a single cache line is 64 bytes, and that's, that's the alignment we're going to care about. But to make it easy, we'll just do 64 bits. Okay, so say this is my table. And I have four attributes. And as we said before, then we're going to store this all continuously in memory in our, in our byte array. So again, for each of these little boundaries, they're going to represent a single 64-bit word. So now when I want to start going across and I want to insert a new tuple, the size of the attribute that I'm trying to store is going to tell me how much memory I'm going to take up as I go across. So the first thing I want to store is the ID field, mass 32 bits. So that's going to be half of our 64-bit word. Then I have this date field, the creation date, and that's 64 bits. And then now it's going to start where the ID ends, and this is expand over the word boundary and take up the, the, the takes up the second half of the first word and the first half of the second word. Then we have a char two, right? And that's that's eight bytes, so that takes up a little more space. And then we have our zip code. It's a 32-bit integer. Again, the same problem before. Now that I span uh, the word boundary. So now if I want to do a lookup, say on creation date, I'm going to jump to some location in memory, and I want to read the, the, this value here. The problem is, is it spans two words. So the, the, the hardware has to do some extra work to go get the data that I actually need. And what it's going to do depends on actually the, the CPU that I'm running on. So the first choice is that uh, the hardware actually would do two reads across those two words, get the data that you need, and then reassemble them in your CPU register, right, to put it back into its single form. Right, this is what you get in x86, uh, and this is what you get in newer ARM processors. Uh, I, I don't know about power. The all alternative is that you just it's sort of random what you get. Maybe you get the first half and not the second half, or maybe you get the second half and not the first half, right? So it's undefined behavior. Right, they say, they, you know, essentially they're saying, don't do this. Uh, the last approach is essentially you throw an exception back. The hardware says, I can't do, you know, trying to do unaligned memory access. I can't do this, and I'm not going to try. So you throw back an exception, and you have to handle that in your process. So ideally, this is what you want, right, because, uh, well, not ideally. Like, this is the nicest thing from a programmer standpoint that's most friendly to us because we don't have to change any, anything in our code. It just... You know, it just magically happens that things are put, you know, put in the correct uh, place. 
But of course, this is going to be slow because now what was one fetch should have been one fetch to memory to go read the thing I wanted to read. Now it's two separate fetches. And so you can see this when you run perf uh, on your process, it'll spit out the number of unaligned memory accesses. And you can use that to figure out where your bottlenecks are in your system. So the way we can fix this in our really simple example is that for anything that is less than a single word, we're just padded out with some extra a bunch of zeros. And so that the next thing we end up writing is nicely word aligned. So in this case here, the ID field is 32 bits. So I'll just put 32 bits afterwards so that when I start writing the creation date, it fits nicely in the next word. So now when I, when I want to do a lookup on creation date, I just I, I know that in my catalog that I have a 32 bit integer plus 32 bits of padding. So I know how to do the right math and jump to the location that has the data that I want. Like the zipc is not word aligned. Say it again? Zipc is not word aligned. Uh, like oh, that's, that's word aligned, right? So I need the, um, again, think of like cache lines. I go fetch this, it comes in as, as a, it's a single fetch from memory that I can put my cache on. And the internally, I'll have an, you know, I'm actually some instructions to say that. All right, if I want to do any reference or anything operation on this, this last zip code field, I know how to jump to that location, but it's still within a single word, so that, that's fine, that'll be fast. So I can take this out of my cache line and put it into my register and do whatever it is I need to do. Whereas in this case, in the, in, the, in the earlier example, to do anything with C date, I had to go fetch the two things, two super fat cache, cache line fetches, go reassemble them, and then I put it in my CPU register and do my operation. Because I can't do any instructions unless things are in the registers. But should ZipC be like the first half of the 64 bit or the second half of the instance like the 64 bit? So I think your statement is this is 32 bits. Yes. So couldn't I just store that here? Yeah. Instead well, of using wasting space with padding? Well, I'm not trying to say that, but yeah. Oh, what, what are you trying to say then? I'm trying to say like, since it's like a half word, should it be like the, half, uh, the first half of the word? Oh, I see. It's, 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 so now this like, this, this is this what eight bit this is eight eight bytes. Yes. Right, is that right? No. Six two bytes. bytes. Six two bytes. bytes. Yeah. Uh, and then this is four bytes. So instead of this starting at offset two, yeah. should it start at offset eight? Yeah, I think from the OS perspective, it should be it's not viewed as word aligned unless it should be like the first half of this. Uh, like, that's it. The office that doesn't know doesn't care, right? That whether it's the beginning or the end. It only cares about did I fetch everything I need in a single, in a single word. So as long as it's in a single word. As long as it's in a single word, that's all I care about. Right, because again, like, I'm bringing this word into my CPU cache, it's a single cache line, it's going to sit in L1. Now I'm taking it out of L1 and put it into my registers in order, in order to execute instructions on it. That's super fast. Going out to memory, if, not, if it's not aligned, that's terrible. I want to avoid that. So the fact that like I got to jump you know, four bytes versus two bytes to get the thing I need to put in the register, it doesn't matter. That's trivial. Yes? Isn't this the same thing that happens when you declare a struct to the scene where these members are Align to these sizes and design data types. So the statement is, and this is what happens when you, uh, if you, if, yeah, if you tell a struct and it's packed correctly, that you get the, you get alignment. Yes, but we're not declaring structs in our data system. We're 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 malloking large blocks of memory, and we need to know how to 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 interpret the bytes. So again, this is I'm showing you 64-bit words in a in a real system. This would be 64 bytes. So I don't care so much about aligning individual attributes, it's more aligning the tuples. So if this was, say the word for my, my, for my tuple ended here, so I ended here, and I had a little extra space, instead of having the next tuple start immediately here, I want to pad it out and start the next one. And again, I sort this in my catalog so that I know how to do the math I need to, I need to, to jump to the right offset. One more statement. All right, so his statement is, this is what I thought he was asking. 
Uh, in this case here, can I be smart and recognize that, oh, the zip code is, is 32 bits. I have 32 bits to spare right here. Instead of storing it at the end and wasting space, can I to pop it down on there? Absolutely, yes. There's no reason you couldn't do this. As far as I know, no database, memory database actually does this. There's no reason you couldn't, right? Because you have to do additional bookkeeping to say, I expect my tuple, logically, when I call create table, it was in this order, but physically it's stored here. Now, for a column store, this doesn't matter because a column store is going to store all the values in a single column together. It's only for a row store. And so, in that case, you may argue the extra stuff, the extra work you have to do to pack things in intelligently in a row store may not be worth it. Well, even if you do that in this case, I don't think it helps because you end up with three words. Yeah. Yeah, in this example, yes. There's still be three words, yes. Okay. So now, all right, so now we know how we're going to organize memory, we know how we're going to store attributes, and now we know how to interpret those attributes. Uh, now we want to sort of think at a higher level, how do we want to organize our tables themselves? So there's three approaches to do this. There's the n-area storage model, the decomposition storage model, and then the hybrid storage model, which, which was in the paper you guys read. So when you took an introduction to database class, uh, they described, the way they describe a database is typically always going to be in the NSM model, Except we just don't we don't tell you that it's NSM, right? So NSM is essentially a row store. It's what it, the, all the examples I've been showing you so far, where the you have your starting location of a tuple, and then you write out all the attributes one after another in the order that they're defined in the create table statement. So this is called the NSM, called NSM. So the NSM approach is ideal for transaction or OLTB workloads because the queries in these workloads or applications typically you're going to access all the attributes of a single tuple. So if I, call, if I have a select star query and do a lookup to go grab one tuple, I, the, the select star means I want all the attributes. And so in the NSM approach, I just jump to my fixed length uh, data blocks, jump to my offset, and just read all the attributes immediately afterwards. Right, And that's going to be really fast because I'm going to have great uh, cache locality because I'm just you know read everything uh, in sequential order. So this is really good for LTP because a lot of these workloads are going grabbing the entire tuple, and it's on a small number of tuples at that. It's also great for insert-heavy workloads because when I insert a tuple, I want to write all, all the memory out all at once, and I just jump to an offset where I have a free slot and just do a mem copy and write everything all, all together. And so this is typically used in the tuple time iterator model um, because, again, we, we just pass around single tuples, so it's really easy. So the way we can store this physically now in the MRE database is one or two approaches. The first is to use what's called heap organized tables, which is what I've been showing here. And this is essentially, again, the, 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 the fixed length data blocks are called heaps. And when at any time we need to insert something, we just find a free slot in the heap and we just go ahead and, and put it in. Um, the, the heap doesn't necessarily define any order. Uh, again, it's just wherever you can put it, wherever you can find a free slot, you put it in there. So most database systems are, are organized in this manner. The other approach is used what are called index organized tables. Um, and this is where the tuples are going to be stored inside of the primary key itself. So the way you start to think about this, say I have a B plus tree, the leaf nodes of the B plus tree are going to, going to be the actual tuples themselves. So this is what MySQL in, in ODB does. This is what uh, MemSQL does with skipless. Right? And the advantage of this is that Whenever I have to do a lookup in my index to find an attribute or a tuple based on its primary key, instead of having to do an extra lookup and say, well, from, from this location or you know, this, this record ID, go find me the data in actual, an actual heap, I get to the leaf of, of, the, of the tree and my data is just right there. All right? So again, this one is probably the most common. This is used in, in some systems. Uh, some of the commercial systems, like, like Oracle, for example, allows you to define whether you want either one or the other, right? Uh, but most of the times, you, you, it's, either, it's, it's either or. You don't get both. Yes? Well, do you want to talk about for variable length using in index organized table tables? Say it again, sorry. Do you do want to look up for variable length field using yeah, so, so his, his, his question is, or statement, in the index organized tables, if I have variable length fields, do I still have to do a, a lookup? Yes. In, in, for the variable length fields in the data pool. Um, also, also say too, in, in some systems, like right, I'm saying primary key index here, if you don't declare a primary key, they'll make one for you, right? So MySQL does this, if you don't 
declare primary key, they, they create an internal record ID. Right? So there's, there's a lot of extra stuff you have to do to make this work. So the advantages of NSM is that it supports fast inserts, updates, and deletes, because I'm assuming I'm going to go grab a single tuple, and I can, I can jump to one location in memory and do whatever it is that I, that I need to do to that one, one spot. It's really good for queries that need the entire tuple. And we're able to use an index oriented physical storage. Whereas when we see the DSM, uh, you, can't, you can't do this. The disadvantages is that this is not good for scanning uh, large portions of the table, as we're to see in, in analytical queries, because most of the times those analytical queries only need a, su a subset of the attributes. And so if I had to scan the entire, uh, if, if I have to scan you know, through the NSM approach, I'm going to jump to different offsets in my in my in my table, and it's going to pollute my cache with a bunch of attributes that I don't care about. Right? So the NSM approach is fast for transactions, but slow for analytics. And conversely, the flip side of this is that the decomposition storage model, the DSM, this is really good for analytical queries that only have to access a small number of attributes because you're going to end up only accessing the just the data that you need. So the idea here is basically we're going to take all our attributes for our table, and instead of storing for a single tuple all those all of its attributes together, we store it as a column where all the attributes for all tuple sorry a single attribute for all tuples are stored contiguously in memory. This is going to have a bunch of different other advantages we'll see on Wednesday when we start, when we start talking about compression. Um, but in general, again, this is what you want to do, use if you, if you want to do analytics. Um, and so for this, we can use the vector at a time uh, iterator model when we process queries, whereas the tuple at a time would be hard to, to do that on this because you have, to, you have to pass along extra metadata to say, here's the column, um, here's the column I'm, I'm actually pushing up to you in my query plan. Or you have to materialize the entire tuple and pass it off, which is bad because it defeats the whole purpose of having this, uh, this layout here. So the DSM approach is definitely in vogue uh, in the last 10 years or so, if not a little longer, but it's been around for a long time. The, so the first known database system that was, that was using more or less a column store approach was this thing called Cantor that came out of the, the Swedish uh, Defense Ministry. And there's only like two papers about Cantor that, that, are, that are published, and they're not technically database papers because they talk about processing files instead of databases, uh, but the basic idea is there. And then in the 1980s, they formally somebody uh, wrote a paper that formally defined what the DSM approach looks like. But it wasn't until the 1990s that Sybase came out with a thing called Sybase IQ that was using the pure sort of DSM model. And so this was an in-memory query accelerator where there was sort of an add-on to the main Sybase uh, database system, Sybase ASE. The idea was that, and we'll see this in a second, like you basically had a cache copy of your database in memory inside its IQ, stored as a fractured mirror column store, and then at runtime when you ran a query, uh, the system could decide, well, should I run it on IQ or should I run it on the, on the regular row store database? In the 2000s is definitely when these things really, uh, the column stores really took off. Uh, there's a bunch of other systems that came out around this time, these OLAP data warehouses, but the three most notable ones are Vertica, VectorWise, and ODDB. So Vertica was started by Mike Stonebreaker, um, uh, it was it's originally a C-Store project out of, out of MIT and Brown, and they, they made a company called Vertica, which was eventually bought by HP. Um, so he came up with the idea because he was at Walmart Labs in the early 2000s and saw the struggles they were having with their Teradata installation, and then he realized what you actually want is a column store to do to support their kind of queries. So they came back to the East Coast and, uh, and started Vertica. Vectorwise is an optimized version of NoDB, so we saw this Vectorwise before when we talked about uh, query compilation, how they pre-compile everything versus compiling things on the fly. So this is the, the guy, Peter Bonsa, started this, worked on ODB and, and thought of a, a, a way to make this better. So Vectorwise was commercialized, and then I got bought by Actian, which is the, so the holding company that now owns the original ingress code. Uh, then they killed the product. If you, if you Googled Vectorwise or Googled Vector they, they, when they renamed it, it would take you to a product page that would then redirect the home page. You could still download it, but it was hard to find, but then they fired everyone that was working on this. Um, but then they brought it back, apparently. But VectorWise is really good. Uh, it's a shame what they did to it. So then, uh, there's a bunch of other systems like Astrodata, but that was a piece of crap. Um, Data Allegro, whatever. Um, 
in the 2010s, is basically everyone realized that a column store is what you want. One, so the big three database companies, IBM, Oracle, and Microsoft, now all sell extensions for uh, their main systems have column stores. But now you have things like Redshift and Impala and HANA and MySQL. Right? These are all systems that are now use column store approach. Because again, for OLAP queries, the performance difference is quite significant. So the thing we've got to deal with in a column store is how we're actually going to be able to identify tuples. So there's essentially two approaches to do this. The first is to use the fixed length offset that we've been talking about so far, where within a, uh, each column, we have a way to do the arithmetic to find the offset that corresponds to a tuple at a position. Right? So if I want the second tuple, uh, I want tuple number two in each column, I know how to look at my catalog and say, well, this column is this type. It has this length, so I know how if I want the if I want the, the, the tuple in the third position, I just do the math and jump to that offset, and now I have the value that I want. In the case of the same thing with double, they have different types, you just do different uh, different jumps into memory to find the thing you're looking for. The other approach is actually to embed the uh, a, a, a internal tuple ID with every single uh, attribute, every single value for every single tuple in every single column. Right? So if I want tuple zero, I have to embed the, uh, the, the ID zero at every single column, every single location, and I have to do some lookup table to figure out how to get there to find the thing that I'm looking for. So you would do this if you had vertebrate length columns, um, whereas if you have fixed length columns, then, then you can do this approach because it's much faster. So as far as I know, nobody actually does this. Everyone does this because this is the better approach. And we'll see later on, actually on Wednesday next, next class, when we start talking about compression, there's going to be techniques where if I could have variable length fields, I could get really great compression ratios. But because I need to be fixed length, then I'm willing to pay a penalty to not get as, as great compression. All right, so again, the advantages of DSM are that the reduced amount of work we have to do because when we scan things, we only scan the columns that have all the data that we need. Um, we'll get better compression because now all the attributes within all the values for a single column or attribute are stored continuously and there would be of the same data type and therefore we can do some compression, you know, run some compression on that to get, uh, to reduce the total size we have to store. For the disadvantages obviously are that for point queries or any single time we need to get the entire, all the attributes, it's going to be really expensive because we have to stitch things together or break them apart to store them in different columns. Now what I'll say though is that Hyper actually claims to support fast transactions, and they store everything as as columns. Um, whereas in all the other systems we'll talk about, they're going to have a row store for all the latest updates, and then a column store for the analytical stuff. Where in Hyper, they store everything as as a column store, and they claim that they're good enough, that they are fast enough, that, that it's not a big bottleneck, even though you have to split and stitch. But we haven't really benchmarked them for, for transactions yet. All right, so one of the things you can take advantage of now when we start talking about can we have a single system that can support both analytics and transactions all together is that we can rely on this fact of, of in database applications is that there's this notion of age or hotness in, 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 of, of data that it's going to allow us to identify whether we want to store things as a column store or store things as a row store. So think about this like when you, when you access a website, like when you go on Reddit or Hacker News, right? You, you read the latest posts. And then you maybe you, you upvote things or add comments to things that, that people are talking about today. You very rarely go back four months ago and leave a comment because no one's going to see it. So what's the point, right? So in, this, in that same idea, if we can identify what, what data is going to be updated, um, most likely to be updated in the future, then we can store that as a row store because there we're going to do transactions on it and we want that to be fast. And then as data gets colder or it's not going to be accessed as transactions anymore, we want to convert it to be stored as a column store because that's going to be faster when we want to do analytics, right? And this is really important because we want to be able to to make decisions on uh, the we want to make decisions on how to to affect the behavior of newer people or newer transactions or new updates based on things that we saw in the past. So the most common setup you often see in, in sort of large database applications is that you have this sort of bifurcated design where you have separate front ends that run all your transactions, the database is running in these separate systems here, and then you have some attract, extract, transform, and load, or ETL process that moves data from the front end to the back end, 
Then you do all your analytics there. And the idea here is that this is, this is sort of the row store, can be really fast to do updates. And then this is sort of the column store, allows you to do uh, analytics very efficiently. But a lot of times what people want to, want to be able to do is they, they want to be able to take things you learn in the back end and push it to the front end so that you can you know, show people different ads or show people different uh, products they, want, they think they want to buy. Um, they help them you know, give you more money. So this is a very common pattern that you see. Um, the problem is though this process here in the middle, this ETL thing, can be really slow because you don't want to start moving data out uh, of your front end and slow down the transactions that, that are ingesting new information. So a lot of times people do this maybe like once every hour, once every day, um, but ideally people want to do this uh, uh, in less time. So this is where a hybrid storage model is going to come into play. And this is the, the hybrid transaction processing workload or HTAP workloads that you guys read about in the paper. So the idea here is that we're going to have a single logical database and then what I mean by logical is that it could run across multiple machines, but it appears to you as the user as a single logical database. You know, for every table you create, you only see one table instance of that. And then what's going to happen is we're going to use different storage models that we talked about before, the NSM and DSM, that we can use for the hot and cold data. So the hot data we want to store as a row store because that's going to be fast for updates. And then for our cold data, where we want to do analytics, we'll store that as a, as, as a DSM. The idea is we're going to do this automatically behind underneath the covers right, to move data out from the NSM to the DSM uh, without the user having to tell us anything. So there are essentially two ways to do this. The first is that we can maintain separate execution engines in our system that are each designed to operate directly on NSM or DSM data. Or we can have a single flexible architecture, a single execution engine that knows how to process and operate on either database. So the separate execution engine approach is pretty common. Uh, and again, the idea is that basically you run two internal database management systems that are designed for either DSM or NSM. And then when a query comes in, you have to figure out, well, what data do I actually need to access? And then direct that query to go either to one or the other or both of them. And then you stitch the answer back to the other to produce a single result to, to the end user. And to do this, if you do an update, you need to use two-phase commit to make sure that uh, you're, 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 both sides are synchronized correctly. So the two approaches to do this are fraction mirrors and then the delta store. So I'll go through both of these. So the fraction mirror approach is, again, essentially we're going to have a complete second copy of the, of the, of the database stored as, as, as a column store. And then what happens is all our updates are, are always going to enter the, del the, the NSM side um, and make all our changes here. And then in the background, we're going we're gonna to uh, send these updates to our mirror and have that be sorted as, as a column store. So now whenever, every time I have an OLAP query comes in, I can have it direct, directly run on the DSM and not interfere with the execution on, on the NSM side. So in Oracle, uh, they call this uh, the Oracle in-memory column store. Um, the, this essentially is not durable. It's just, just a, 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 an in-memory cache or copy. So if you blow away the system, uh, this thing goes away, and then you come turn the system back online, then it has to rebuild this. But this is always going to be persistent and always durable because this is the primary copy of, of the database. So you may think this is kind of wasteful, right, that you have to make these copies over this. But when you think about it from, from, a, from a business side point, uh, point of view, Oracle has an amazing uh, uh, customer base, right? It's the most widely deployed database, my, except for SQLite. Um, and they make a lot of money. Larry Nelson has a big yacht. And so you don't want to interrupt uh, people's applications by having them have to you know, rewrite their code to figure out whether they should use a DSM or an NSM. Right? You can get all the ecosystem of Oracle for free, and only the covers, they manage this copy of, of the data. The alternative is use a delta store approach. And this is where we have a sort of front end delta store stored as, as a DSM, or sorry, NSM. And then we have our any data that gets moved out of the delta store stored as a DSM in this, this second part here. So all your updates go into here, the delta store, because that can be really fast, so that's transactional and, and it's a row store. And then in, in the background, you'll migrate the data over to the, the historical record, the archive record. So this approach is used in HANA, it's used in uh, Vertica, 
splice machine, uh, snappy data. This is a very common approach. And typically what happens is they sort of make a Frankenstein system. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. I mean, they, they basically stitch together some existing databases to make them work like this, right? So in the case of like snappy data, they took Gemfire and um, like Spark, put those two together, right? Splice machine is HBase plus Spark, right? So they don't have to maintain, they don't have to write uh, two, two completely brand new systems. They just have a little bridge code in the, in the middle that knows how to move things over. And then you have some layer above it to say, if I have to do an analytical query, should I go to, you know, I do my scan on this, and then I have to check this, make sure I, if there's any updates that I missed or included in the output. So I'm being hand waving on how you actually decide how to move data, um, but there's three approaches to do this. So the first is that you have a manual approach where basically the human tells you, uh, human DBA tells the data system what data should move and when should it move it. In the case of MemSQL, they have the Delta store and the, and the archive store approach that I showed in the last slide, but they require a human to tell you, you know, what data should be a row store versus what data should be a column store. You have an offline approach where the data system is going to monitor a log offline and they make decisions about what to move uh, when, when it's appropriate. Or you can have an online approach where essentially the system watches how queries access data and then they can make decisions based on what they think is going to happen in the future or what data is not being accessed anymore to move them to, to one, one side or the other. All right, so just to finish up, I want to talk about what we do in Peloton. So we decided to build a single execution engine architecture that is able to operate directly on NSM and DSM data uh, all transparently to the user. So the nice advantage of this is that we don't have to store two, two copies of the data as you would in fractured mirrors. And then we don't have to, to sync the two different data engines because it's all inside a single code base. So the, the system can still use the Delta store approach that we saw before. Um, but the idea with this is that we don't have to have against these standalone systems synchronized with each other. Everything's all, always in sync. So the basic idea looks like this. So say this is our original data, it's originally stored as, as an NSM, and then we look at the access patterns of the queries that we're executing, and we see in this case here, we're doing an update and we access all, all, all columns. And this, we do an analytical query and we're only accessing two of them. So the idea is that we want to identify what data is, is hot and data is cold based on how it's actually being used, and then we can split this up into a different layout so that the hot data sort of is it. NSM and the cold data stored as, as, as DSM. So if you look in the code, you'll see this uh, this notion of tiles, and this is essentially how, how we're able to represent this, do this. So the, the execution engine processes tiles, but before it processes the tile, our tile group, it looks and says, what's the layout for this tile, tile group? Does a look up in the catalog and say, well, what attributes am I, do I have? and now knows how to jump to the right offset to find the data that it needs. And then in the case of query compilation, we can compile a query that, that can operate multiple tile groups at the same time, um, and it knows that different tile groups are stored in different ways, so we, we generate different code to access them uh, separately. So here we have tile group A and tile group B. Tile group A, tile group a is stored as a, a, a column store, sorry, row store, and tile group B is stored as a uh, column store. And then internally it's broken up with different tiles. So then we also have this thing called a tile group header that basically ends up being a, a, a just extra metadata to say what's going on in each tile. And then when we have a uh, query that needs to access different tile groups, we know how to map, we know how to route them to get to the right offset that has the data that we need. And again, this is all done for you underneath the covers. So the last slide I want to show you is the performance benefit you can get from having an adaptive layout. So this is a workload where we took, um, or we derived from an from a, a online web application, and we, we contrived an example where we represented what the workload would look like in a, with a dinoral pattern of doing a bunch of inserts during the day when people are active, and then doing analytics at night when we, when we want to do, try to figure out what happened during the day. So the, the, the workload is broken up to discrete segments where we do a bunch of scans, follow a bunch of inserts, follow a bunch of scans, and so forth. So if you store everything as a row store, what you can see is that the scans take long and then the inserts are really fast, right? Because it's really fast to do inserts in a, in a, in a row store. For a column store, you'll see that the scans will take less time than the row store because everything is a column store. We, we, we can just read the attributes we need. 
But in the errand search, it takes slightly longer because we have to take a tuple, break it up into different attributes, and store them into separate memory locations. But if you have a, an adaptive layout, you end up seeing you get the best of both worlds. So at the very beginning here, we're doing just as, just as well as the row store for a scan query because we haven't seen any queries before. So we're just going to, everything's going to be stored as a row store. We haven't adapted anything yet. So in this environment, anytime you insert a new tuple, it always ends up as a row store by default. But then what we see is that we observe that we're accessing data as in, that could be better suited in a column store layout. So over time, we start migrating it. And so that at speeds of our scan queries. Then now when we do our inserts, we match the speed as the row store because, again, we're always inserting as a row store. But then what you see is that over time, now when we start doing scans again, we're, we're, we're able to get the same, better performance than the, the column store because we can be smart about how we combine to get tuples together or columns together so that they're fit nicely in a single cache line. So it's one fetch to go get us all the attributes we need, all the data we need for a single tuple. So this is showing that from an adaptive data store, it's a single database engine a single user interface, a single copy of the database, and you get the best of both worlds of a column store and a row store. Yes? And for the second scan, the, this one here. Yeah, it has like those row layout things called them that. Yeah, so what happens here, so yeah, the reason why the question why is this little blip up here? So I do all my scans and I start reorganizing the data to, to, be, to be a column store. So I, I start doing better, than, I start performing like a column store. Then I do a bunch of inserts, but now when I start scanning that data again, I'm scanning both column, the, the, the row store data I just inserted plus the column store data. These are essentially doing full table scans. And so my performance is slightly worse because I'm reading much insert data. Uh, same thing over here. But then over time, the majority of the data that I'm reading is a row store, sorry, is a column store. So I'm getting the benefits of, of being uh, the, the DSM model. Yes. How is your insert better than the columns, column layout? Uh, the insert for a different table. Why am I insert better than the column layout? Because mm -hmm. I'm inserting as a row store. Yeah. So the scan is scan and so it's a, for a different table. Store. Same table, but I'm inserting, I'm inserting new tuples. It always ends up in the row store portion of the same table, right? So again, it's not like uh, in MemSQL. Either everything's a row store, everything's a column store. Within a single logical table, I can physically sort them in different ways. Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a rate too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze as a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl run me and my mic down with oil Records still turn with third degree burns for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives